by welcoming you to the technical forum here at the group exhibit Hydrogen and Fuel Cells 2013. We invite you to have a seat, to have a free drink here on the house and enjoy with us the next presentation by ITM Power dealing with the topic High Power Density Fuel Cells for Automotive Application by the CTO, Dr. Simon Byrne. Give him a big hand, please. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is our uh, materials used in fuel cell applications. Before I jump into that, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to ITM and then say something about some of the challenges that face fuel cells in the rollout of automotive vehicles. And then I'm going to describe our materials and uh, what they are chemically, how we make them and then give you a quick snapshot of some of the results we've achieved and give an update on some durability data. So ITM, we're fundamentally an electrolyzer company. We make integrated systems and we're interested in uh, three key markets, clean fuel, energy storage and renewable heat. The technology in the electrolyzer is PEM and some of that technology is what's also applicable in our fuel cells. So first of all, there's much talk about fuel cell vehicles and how they're going to be rolled out over the coming years. And there's a few challenges in there to do with cost that I think are worth flagging. There are several nation, uh, nationally coordinated Is that okay? Great, sorry about that. So there are several national schemes that are designed to coordinate the rollout of both fuel cell vehicles and the hydrogen infrastructure to support those vehicles. And what we see is a very significant drive to reduce the cost of all of those components, particularly the fuel cell vehicles. And within the fuel cell vehicle, the, the stack itself is the most expensive component. So if you're going to tackle cost reduction, that's a very good place to start. Um, what we, um, what we see is that uh, power density is widely recognized as being the single most important factor in reducing the cost of fuel cells. Because if you can squeeze more power per square centimeter, you need less square centimeters of stack. So that gives you a cost reduction through miniaturization, and it also helps you to reduce uh, weight and volume, which is very attractive for mobile applications. Now, to give an idea of what um, uh, power density is an industry benchmark is one watt per square centimeter at 670 millivolts and that's something that is quite a tough target to meet okay so now i'm going to talk a little bit about our materials and how they're relevant the first thing to say is that they are unlike conventional uh, fluorocarbons our materials are based on hydrocarbon in ingredients which means they uh, the components we use to construct them are a lot cheaper they're cross-linked rather than an, an entanglement network, which means they're very well held together and they're very well um, uh, buffered mechanically. We make them by mixing together a bunch of liquids that we do to our own particular formula. And um, by doing that, we can modify the functional properties over a very wide range. They are also patented worldwide, both the materials and the manufacturing process. To so go into a little bit more detail, what I've got on the screen are examples of some of the main ingredients. On the um, left-hand side is an example of uh, acrylonitrile, which is something that can define the long-range mechanical structure of the polymer. Next to that is vinyl pyrilidone, and that's a component that will attract water and hold water into the structure. And that's very important in maintaining high ionic conductivity in a membrane. In fact, lots of balance of plant in fuel cell systems is often dedicated to maintaining hydration of the membrane materials. AMSA is a, 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 an, a, um, a, one of the possible ionic moieties. That's what makes it conductive. And then on the right-hand side, there's a cross-linking agent which holds the whole thing together. So if you imagine being able to substitute those ingredients for different things, change the ratio of those ingredients, you don't really have a material, you have a suite of materials. And we have spent a very long time, many years, understanding how those ingredients play together to make sure we can um, 
engineer these materials to specific applications with particular properties. So I'm now going to jump into some of the uh, some of the results and what those materials mean in terms of performance. So the first thing I wanted to show is a result achieved with hydrogen and oxygen. And this um, series of tests were done some time ago now, but they were designed to challenge the membrane to show how, um, how much power we could squeeze out of it. And what we can see is a power density in excess of 5.5 watts per square centimetre, which is over 10.5 amps per square centimetre. And that's several times greater than anything we've seen published anywhere else. Now, Admittedly, we're using oxygen instead of air, but as an experiment to determine what the membrane is capable of, I think it's very powerful in demonstrating what we can achieve. So as we move on to hydrogen and air, we've been lucky enough to work with the Carbon Trust, which is uh, part of um, um, the, the UK government. They've uh, worked with us to uh, explore how we transition from hydrogen and oxygen to hydrogen and air. As you make that transition, you always um, um, observe a, a, a loss in power density because the oxygen which is involved in the reaction is diluted with nitrogen. But what we could demonstrate is that we could move to air and still maintain an unusually high power density, achieving over 2.1 watts per square centimetre at over um, 4 amps per square centimetre. Power density isn't everything. There's a number of things to look at, including uh, catalyst loading, sensitivity to hydration, and also durability. And these are things that take a long, long time to fully explore and understand. So this is a snapshot of how the membranes can behave um, with different humidity. So if you imagine a fuel cell being supplied with um, um, humidified hydrogen and humidified air, they're given a very comfortable ride and they always stay in an ideal hydrated condition. If you want to use a, um, a membrane in a fuel cell application um, such as um, automotive, that's just not realistic at all. They're heating up, they're cooling down, all sorts of things are happening and the hydration level changes significantly. And what this uh, graph shows, I don't know if it's clear to see, but we've got relative humidity across the bottom and conductivity of the membrane um, up the side. And as we, we used um, with three materials here, this one is a conventional fluorocarbon material, and these two are different formulations of one of our materials. As you take water out of the membrane, you will always see a drop in uh, ionic conductivity, and that's why you get the downward gradient. However, our materials have got this extra water attracting component bonded into the structure, so they do very well at holding that water in. If you overcome that and spend the time to dehydrate them, you can see you will still see a, a loss in ionic conductivity, but over that entire range of uh, relative humidity, the conductivity is still significantly higher than the incumbent uh, fluorocarbon. Because now I'm going to give a little bit of a, uh, an update on durability, um, talk about some of the in, um, industry protocols that are used, issues to do with scale-up, and uh, also accelerated stress testing. So to start off with, there's some ex situ tests you can do relatively quickly to look at um, how well your materials survive in aggressive conditions. And there's two ones that we've used uh, most extensively. One is uh, exposure to a mixture called Fenton's reagent. Basically, that's got all sorts of horrible things in there that attack the membrane. And the other is um, a 24-hour boil test. And that means putting, the, water, uh, putting a, the membrane in some water and boiling it continuously for 24 hours and measuring if you lose any of the material in the process. Now, Fenton's reagent is um, pretty aggressive to hydrocarbon materials. So there's always, fluorocarbons will always win in this race. But we've spent a long time looking at the, um, the degradation mechanisms that are um, triggered, and we're now able to achieve the sort of um, uh, uh, durability with Fenton's reagent with our materials as we've been able to achieve with fluorocarbons. Um, the pictures aren't very illustrative, but they're just to show you that we have done the tests and the materials do survive. On the bottom there, we, uh, there's, a, there's a material that's gone through a 24-hour boil test, and we see no mass loss whatsoever. 
Okay, so then moving into some more um, aggressive in situ testing. So we've now got the, uh, the membrane inside a cell and we're operating it. One of the most recognized um, accelerated tests is called open circuit hold, open circuit voltage hold. And what we're doing here is we're allowing the fuel cell to achieve its maximum voltage without drawing any current. And then you continue to pump gases through the cell at a particular temperature and in a particular way and watch what happens to that open circuit voltage. Because the voltage is high, you're in a region where you can create peroxides which attack the membrane and you're also in a, um, a, a zone that can cause the catalyst to agglomerate. So there's all sorts of degradation mechanisms that can have happen there. And the US Department of Energy have, di have dictated how this test ought to run and they say that you need to um, uh, you can allow the voltage to drop by 20% of its maximum value and then the test is over. And what the DOE say as a target is 200 hours. And what we've achieved so far is we're out at about 700 hours. So that's three and a half times that, that very aggressive durability test. I'm not, I'm not saying that means this will last forever. There's still lots of heavy lifting to do, but it's a very, very positive indication that there's uh, the, the key degradation mechanisms at play um, we can handle. While you're doing that, that test, there are a number of things that you need to keep monitoring. Um, one of those is, look, is um, hydrogen permeability. So if you start to see high portions of hydrogen migrating through the membrane to the oxygen side, that's an indication that the membrane is starting to break down in some way. So what we, can, we can measure that um, electrochemically um, during the course of the test and we can plot that out. And what I've done here is tried to compare our results with what the DOE published. And you need to be aware of the scale. We're, I'm going up to 600 hours here. 600 hours on the DOE chart is kind of in the middle. Um, and what we can see is that during the, the period of our test, we've got a pretty continuous, unchanged uh, crossover rate, which is equivalent to around one milliamp per square centimeter. What you can see here is that the baseline is around 10 milliamps per square centimeter. So we're an order of magnitude lower in terms of our hydrogen permeability, which is a very positive thing, but also that hydrogen permeability isn't changing throughout the course of the test. The other thing you need to look at while you're doing this uh, durability is the, uh, is the catalyst to see how that's performing. And um, I'm not enough of an electrochemist to do this justice, but essentially this is an electrochemical um, process to map the surface area of the catalyst. And what you what you're looking for is changes in this, in this area in the middle. What we can see is that we're having minimal change in catalyst surface area, which again doesn't mean all problems are solved, but it's a very positive indication that there's no major problems um, uh, taking place. So I'm aware I've gone through all of that quite quickly. I'm happy to take questions. I think to summarize, I feel that we've had um, for some time some encouraging evidence of um, our membrane material being um, offering some very promising results for high power density and that being an attractive route to reduce cost and as time is rolling on we're getting through a lot of testing and continuing to take technical risk away and I feel now that we're getting to a stage where um, we, um, I feel um, quite confident to talk to uh, potential uh, end users. Our strategy is to partner, we don't intend to make fuel cell systems in the way that we make electrolyzer systems and if anybody would like to talk about this further, we're on stand B60, which is just by the main stage. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Byrne, for this interesting presentation. Has anybody now here from the audience any questions or wants to make a remark or a comment? Not yet. So maybe everybody will come to you to the booth. So where you are, over there? Yeah. No it's problem. B60. B60, yeah. Okay. And you okay. will stay here until tomorrow? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. Tomorrow That's well. fine. Okay. Okay. Simon, thank you for being here. Thank and you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So after a short break, we will continue our program with a little presentation and a panel discussion about the topic high safe, um, who cares for safety? Thank you very much for being here. Have a seat, have a free drink on the house. In 10 minutes, we continue our program. Thank you very much.